Welcome back to Brandon Smith, the rugby. Today in this video, it's all about Major League Rugby, all about USA Rugby. I'm wearing the shirt here. And this week I was joined by two fantastic guests from the MLR Rants, the fantastic podcast covering everything Major League Rugby. I'll leave the link to their podcast down below. Do go check it out. It is the big guy, Scott Ferrara, and of course, Rob Hammerschmidt from Hammer Rugby. Make sure to subscribe to the channel here on Brandon Smith Rugby. This week, we're talking about Hawaii. Should Hawaii have a Major League Rugby team? It was rumoured. We spoke on it on their podcast a few weeks ago. All of us decided that it wasn't right now, but they have put a bid in and it has been accepted and they have 90 days to prove that they are ready to host a Major League Rugby team on the island. As always, subscribe and leave your thoughts in the comments down below. Here's the video. Enjoy. Um, if you can both give me one reason why it's good to have rugby in Hawaii and maybe one downside to that as well. Um, let's start with Rob. Um contradicting yourself maybe from uh, episode six or are we all not at all i not at all i believe the the hesitation was travel mm -hmm. and logistics and when we had Ken, uh, kilgore on the show he addressed those uh, straight away they're working with an airline out of hawaii they're working with hotels and they promised the other owners that when they have to go to hawaii that it's not going to cost them any additional fees for their players and their admin to come over and uh, for three play years i think he said. for three years yeah so they they're addressing that and i believe that's part of the provisional piece it's not just about uh some of the money that has to be demonstrated or the liquidity but it's it's going to come down to demonstrating that they can uphold that promise uh when they secure those uh we're going to see that provisional bid turn into a um, an accepted bid. Um, so uh, one of the things that I think is an advantage of this is, and, and for folks in the UK, they probably won't know, but there are some tremendous athletes in Hawaii that the this kind of low uh, franchise can really take advantage of. And we've seen here in America, there are two uh, names most recently that stand out, uh, two of Iowa, and uh, of course, Marcus Mariota, both of them are Heisman Trophy winners. I mean, tremendous athletes playing at the quarterback position. So we're talking about decision makers. We're talking about people that read the game, that have to make split decisions on the field when they play. Imagine these two guys having de developed and grown up if rugby was professional, if rugby was uh, more high profile, and if rugby was a pathway to professionalism and having and being able to support your extended family in Hawaii. Um, th that is what the franchise, the Kanalo franchise, is going uh, to provide young players. Uh, and I forgot his name. There's a young man that just signed with uh, Life University, uh, three-time national champs here at the college level. Uh, he was uh, recruited by BYU but uh, for, for American football. He's going to be going to like to play rugby. So that demonstrates the power of rugby in Hawaii. Um, one of the legit, one of the challenges um, I think is, is, I don't think it's going to be travel anymore. I think they're going to answer that question for them. It's in the short term, where are they going to play and are they going to be able to make their on-field play uh, d uh, play well uh, in terms of crowd in a, such a huge space, they're going to be playing in a 50,000 seat stadium. Even if they get 10,000 people, the people are going to look lost until they develop the infrastructure. Um, that's going to look a little strange, but they've got a plan for it guys. Exactly. And I think Hawaii obviously have big connections to uh, Fiji, Samoa, Tonga, and we know how crazy they are about rugby. As you said, they're incredible athletes, uh, you know, again, running out skinny guys like me, uh, would not particularly fancy it. Um, but yeah, I think it's really exciting to have rugby on the island. Again, being on Hawaii, they may feel quite disconnected to Major League Rugby on, on the mainland. And also, as I was listening to your podcast earlier uh, yesterday, there is no professional sports team on the island. This is a massive opportunity for rugby to really stake its claim on the island. Um, Scott, what are your thoughts on, uh, on Hawaii having a MLR side? Well, uh, there's an obvious advantage to it in that it, again, builds the profile in those Polynesian uh, Southern Hemisphere countries. Mm. Um, you know, we were talking to Cam about when they have their games, it's something that in New Zealand and Australia might be just a little bit early morning when they have night games, you know, things like that. So I think the for the television exposure for a team to say, you know, San Diego is going to go and play in Hawaii, you know, that might end up on, you know, New Zealand, Australian television. Um, so now you're you're updating that profile to the Southern Hemisphere uh, fans. Um, I think uh, the biggest disadvantage um, that they they will have is 
getting uh, players to come over because the cost of living in Hawaii is so high. Um, but in a, different from the premiership, the MLR has a strict uh, um, a, 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 a salary cap, but it's only on what they're getting paid. It's not on ancillary things. So, for example, in New York, the cost of living is very high, right? So Rooney provides a house rent free for these for a lot of their players to live in because they know, especially if they don't live in New York and they're coming from places like Colorado or Texas or you know from other countries, we're going to provide you with housing and transportation to get you to practice, and that doesn't go into the salary cap. Yeah. And I think that's uh, an important thing to to understand. Uh, for non-Americans uh, watching the MLR, is is it gives the chance for these guys to grow because the, you can't buy this, the, you can't rent the same apartment in New York that you can in Texas, and it wouldn't be fair to New York to to then say, okay, we're going to add that to your salary cap. Now, you know, uh, a two thousand dollar a month apartment is going to be added to everybody's salary. You know, it, it gets a little ridiculous, and we saw in the Premiership with the Saracens and stuff, they mm. got in trouble doing things, even though the Premiership said they could do it. Three years later, they're they're backtracking and said they can't all of a mm. sudden, which I found weird. But so I think in Hawaii, it's going to be trying to get players' cost of living. But one of the things Cam Kilgore, their GM, did say was that they are going to uphold the promise of having at least twenty five percent Hawaiian players on mm. the squad, so that helps them out a lot. Um, also, I think one of the big things that they're going to do is, you know, this is unique to the MLR in, in recent seasons. New York did it. Um, New England did it. Toronto has done it. Where they've played their away games in big groups. So, like, for example, in 2019, yeah. because it was so cold, New York played, like, eight away games in a row before they had a set of eight home games in a row. And that's something Hawaii can do. They can go and say, hey, we're going to set up home base in San Diego, play all of our away matches we need to play in the conference, play a couple East Coast teams, always come back to let's say San Diego. And then that way the guys feel like they still have a base, a home base to come home to, and it won't mess up their practice schedules trying to then fly across the, the Pacific ocean. So I think that's one of the things they're kind of gearing towards that people might not know that can get around that travel restriction. And on that note, don't forget Chicago's right there in between the East coast and the West oh, coast. So it's a great opportunity for them to come and provide a home base here. And, and, uh, you know, I say that in jest, but, um, the disconnect uh, that you mentioned, Brandon, uh, don't forget that those guys, when they come here, they're going to be representing major league rugby. Yeah. And so when they, when they, when those players from Kanaloa come and stay for two or three weeks at a time, and they're doing their stint here in the States, they're going to be reaching out and they're going to be helping grow the game of rugby in and around with the, the schools, uh, with the, with the middle school and high school programs. And so that's something that will actually continue to allow them to stay connected to the league and to American rugby as a whole. And, and we can't undersell what that's going to do for the development of rugby in the United States. And, and I think if, if the teams are smart, because like every, all the teams have these community outreach programs, when Kanaloa comes and is going to set up with them, do, do a, something joint with them. And then that way you can bring that, that Hawaiian uh, aspect to the continental United States and edu maybe do some education about the indigenous population of Hawaii to the kids in Texas, to the kids in New England, to the kids in NOLA that wouldn't get that opportunity.